Hi, everyone. I'm going to get started. I think I'm at the optimal mix of exhaustion and stage anxiety right now. <laughs> My name is Nick Yi. I'm the co-founder and analytics lead of Quantic Foundry. Um, let me spend just two minutes to get everyone roughly on the same page. We created an online app where gamers could take a five-minute survey and get a personalized report of how they score relative to other gamers on a bunch of motivations. As we gather data, we use factor analysis to see how these preferences cluster together. We replace weak loading items, and we kept doing this until a stable model emerged. We made the profiles easy to share on social media. We didn't target any specific game titles or game genres. About 70% of our traffic uh, comes from social media. It's gamers asking their friends to take the profile outside the context of a specific game website, a specific game title, or game genre. To date, over 280,000 people have taken the gamer motivation profile. Our sample does skew towards a core gamer profile, so about 70% of the sample identify as core, 20% as hardcore, and 10% as casual. There's a 80-20 split, roughly, between male and female players. About 1% identify as non-binary. The median age of our sample is 25. Here's a model that emerged from all that data. We identified 12 distinct motivations that group into six higher level pairs. So motivations in the same column tend to be highly correlated. If a gamer cares about one, they are likely to, but not always, going to care about the other. At the highest level, we identified three clusters of gaming motivations. So the action social cluster is about the appeal of excitement and social interaction. The mastery achievement cluster is about long-term thinking and planning and accumulating points. And finally, the immersion creativity cluster is the appeal of being a part of and exploring the world. Like last year, I'm going to start with higher level findings about the motivations and then drill down. So I'll start with the motivations first in general, and then some demographic findings, and then I'll talk about specific game titles and game genres. When we show people the table of motivations, one common misconception is that they're looking at a laundry list of motivations, but it's actually not a list. It's a map of the structure of gaming motivations. It's not about who has a longer list or a bigger list. The size of the list doesn't really matter. What matters is that the table is showing how motivations are related to each other. So let me give you an example of a finding just by looking at the table itself. As many of you know, uh, my business partner, Nick Ducheneau, and I have spent a lot of time studying MMOs. And in the MMO community, there's a common assumption that when it comes to people and social interaction, there is a spectrum. On the one side, you have the warm and fuzzy social care bears. And on the other side, you have the antisocial, hyper-competitive PVP player. So it's easy to come away, especially if you've been studying MMOs, you come away with the assumption that happy social interaction is the exact opposite of competitive behavior. And this simplified dichotomy is also incredibly comforting because it just so happens to conform to gender stereotypes of how men and women play MMOs. But it's actually not true. Competition isn't the opposite of community and teamwork and chatting and interaction. In fact, especially when you look across gamers as a whole, the gamers who enjoy community also tend to be the exact ones who enjoy competition. Social is social. So the people who like social interaction like it in its, all its forms, whether it's chatting or gossiping or being on a team or playing against another team. It's all social interaction to them. This is what it means when the table has both competition and community in the same column. The real spectrum, the real social spectrum that differentiates gamers is whether they care about social interaction at all. So there are gamers who keep to themselves. They don't like talking to other people, even in MMOs. But once someone cares about social interaction, once they care about social, more likely than not, they care about all forms of social interaction. I think it was easy to believe the dichotomy in MMOs 
because it is a set of notorious and highly visible kind of anti-social behavior that everyone is aware of, whether it's spawn camping, or if you're old enough to remember this, in Star Wars Galaxies, you could wait till someone got in your house, and then you could place a piece of furniture in front of the door, and you could trap them in there, in your house. So there was all sorts of griefing, anti-social behavior that became lumped with PVP, and it was coded as hyper-competitive. But that's not what competition really is about. It was just an idiosyncratic feature of MMOs that no one actually designed for. But back to the larger point that I'm trying to make. The finding about social interaction is an example of how the chart of motivations surfaces the relationships between gaming motivations. So if the question is, what else is this audience likely to be interested in and motivated by, we can think of the correlations like spreading activation. When one thing lights up, the motivations closest to it are also going to be, tend to be lit up. So let's say we start with any of the 12 motivations in the model. What the chart is saying is knowing nothing else about the audience. The best bet for what the audience is most likely to be interested in in a game is the other motivation in the same column. And if we need to flesh this out more, then the next secondary best bets are the motivations that are adjacent but still within the same cluster. There's another reason why the laundry list metaphor is misleading. It conveys the incorrect belief that all these motivations have equal weight or they behave in the same way, that you're working with an open palette and you can mix and match. But motivations actually aren't created equal. Some are very volatile, whereas others are relatively inert. So let me show you a chart. In our model, excitement is the appeal of fast-paced gameplay with a lot of surprises and thrills. So in the chart, the horizontal axis is age, from age 13 to 60. Every dot is the average of the thousands of gamers at that specific age point. And the vertical axis is the score on excitement. So the higher the dot, the more important excitement is, is to these gamers. So excitement drops linearly with age. The older a gamer is, the less interested they are in that kind of adrenaline-filled gameplay. And every year, it keeps going down just a little bit more. Of the 12 motivations in our model, competition is the one that's the most age volatile. By this, I mean it's the motivation that changes the most with age. In our model, competition is the appeal of duels, matches, scoring high on ranked leaderboards. We showed you a less detailed version of this chart last year when we talked about gender differences. We showed you competition last year because it's the motivation that men and women are most different on. It also turns out to be the motivation with the largest age difference. So in this sense, competition is a very volatile motivation. It's, it changes a lot by both gender and age. Where excitement was linear, Competition has a nonlinear relationship with age. It drops rapidly between ages 13 to 30 and then slowly reaches a stable trough around age 40. There are practical implications for game design uh, from this finding. You know, for example, competition is one of these very obvious motivations. It shows up a lot in gamification mechanic lists. Um, but what the data is suggesting that competition is likely a poor motivator for most corporate employees above age 30. It's great if you're working with a younger crowd, 25 and under. Let me go back to the chart, and let me go back to the trough, and I'm gonna expand the chart now uh, by gender. So the blue line is male and the orange line is female. There's something really interesting about that trough. So even though competition is the most volatile motivation of the 12, there's nevertheless this surprisingly stable window between ages 40 and 60. So suddenly, the volatility is gone, and the audience becomes essentially homogenous. As opposed to any other point on the graph, when you hit 40 and beyond, suddenly in terms of competition, everyone is almost exactly 
the same, and I'm going to rephrase a point that we made last year. You know, compared to the hubbub around gender differences in gaming, it's surprising how little we talk about how gaming motivations change as people get older. Um, it's interesting because we're all gamers in this room. We're not going to stop gaming. And the one thing we have in common is that we're all getting older. But not all motivations are volatile. Some motivations are incredibly inert and consistent. So let me show an example of this. Um, completion in our model is one of the more stable motivations. It's the appeal of completing missions and quests in a game, collecting all the collectibles, finding all the stars, getting all the trophies. In this chart, the vertical axis is scaled to be the same as it was in competition, just to show you how flat it is relatively. But completion was interesting for another property. I'm going to change the way we look at the motivations real quick. So every gamer who takes the gamer motivation profile, they come away with a score for each of the 12 motivations. So a simplified way of looking at all the motivations at the same time is to figure out the primary motivation of each gamer, the motivation that they scored highest on. So if we do that, here's the chart we get for male gamers. The columns add up to 100%. Every gamer in the data gets one entry. So among male gamers, the most common primary motivations are competition, destruction, and completion. For the female gamers, the most common motivations are completion, fantasy, and design. And we did this over and over again with all the several segments in the data that we have. So the gender segments, the age segments. And after we did this, we noticed that what was interesting about completion is that it's always in the top three of every chart we sliced. So not only is completion a very stable motivation by age, it's also the most consistently appealing motivation across the motivations that we measured in the model. So whether we're talking male gamers, female gamers, gamers of all ages, the appeal of collecting things and working towards completing missions, that's one motivation that's a consistently good bet. And it's the only one that had this property among the 12. This sense of variance and volatility isn't only a measure of individual motivations, but we can also apply it to specific demographic segments. So as we were compiling these charts, we noticed another interesting thing about female gamers. So here's those two charts compressed side by side, the female one on the left, the male one on the right. Um, we noticed that there's a softer slope from the most common to the least common primary motivation among the men than it, is, than it is for the women. So there's a steeper drop for the women. Or put another way, female gamers are more similar in their tastes compared with men. There's more consistency in what they really like and what they really don't like. Let me quantify this in, in two ways. Uh, we calculate the delta between the most and the least common motivation for men. There, there's a factor of 2.5. For women, it's a factor of 5.7, so there's more than twice the difference. Another way to look at the cumulative coverage, so the top three motivators for women cover roughly half the women, whereas for the men, the top three motivations cover just a little over a third of the men. So I've been slowly building up your intuition about the relationship between variance and audience coverage, and that's what we're going to dive into now. And there's, a, and there's a practical reason for spelling this out. It's the relationship between these two uh, variables. So usually when we summarize a population, we show you a statistic of the average, often the mean. But using the mean to describe the population alone doesn't tell you how volatile a variable could be. So you could have a trait or preference that's highly stable and consistent. There's just a tiny amount of spread around the mean. Or there could be a widespread around the mean, but in both cases, uh, the mean is exactly the same. But it makes a huge difference in terms of audience coverage. The less variance there is, the more similar the audience is, and the easier it is to achieve coverage of that audience. So this is why it was easier to have better coverage of the female gamers, because the female gamers were more consistent in their gaming motivations, less variance, higher coverage. So. 
I'm going to dive into some visualizations of this. I'm going to plot appeal against variance. So the appeal is what we've been looking at in the primary motivation charts, right? So this is the vertical axis. The higher something is in, in the chart, the more common the appeal is. It's got higher appeal, it's high priority. The lower it is, the lower appeal it is. For variance, we looked at the rank order of the 12 motivations in the entire data set. So when we looked at primary motivations, we only looked at the, the top one. In the rank ordering for every, you know, we look through all the motivations and their rank order through the 280,000 gamers and calculate the standard deviation of the rank order variation. So the motivations, the dots on the left hand side have low variance. They're more stable within the population. The dots on the right hand side, they're more volatile. They're harder to reach coverage. We end up with this quad, right? So the things at the top left, that are popular and low on variance. They're easy wins, they're consistently appealing. The things on the bottom left, it's the danger zone. It's consistently unappealing. The things on the top right are safe bets. They're appealing, but there's a bit more variance. And the things on the bottom right are risky bets. They're both unappealing and there's high amount of variance. So here's what it looks like for male gamers. So we're looking at the 12 motivations for the male gamers. One thing that's interesting is that there are no motivations in the top left quadrant. There are no easy wins for male gamers. The most popular motivations among male gamers are also the ones that are the most volatile. So as a whole, men are a fairly volatile audience to design for. And I've talked a lot about competition, and that's why competition is at the top and helps you understand the other motivations in that space. Competition is volatile because of age. What this graph is showing is hard to design for men because a lot of things that men like change according to their age. Let me switch now to the female gamers. We see a very different picture with the female data. The most popular motivations here have either a low or moderate amount of variance. So design sticks out as being the most consistently appealing motivation for female gamers. It's the appeal of expressing your individuality, lots of customization options, lots of avatar options. Um, and then completion and fantasy, which were the top one and two, are quite near the midline in terms of variance. Community is interesting. So community is the one that's all the way at the right-hand side. We typically stereotype female gamers as being social care bearers, that they really care about the chit-chat. But that's not an accurate description of female gamers as a whole. In fact, community is right in the middle of appeal, and it has the largest variance of all the motivations among female gamers. So there, there are a lot of female gamers who don't care about socializing at all. So counterintuitively, it's actually easier to design games for women currently. We were reminded of the parable of looking for the key under the street lamp, you know, rather than where you drop the key. What's interesting is that both with age and gender, it turns out that the groups where it's easiest to achieve coverage for are precisely the ones that are stereotyped to not be gamers, whereas the audience that we do tend to focus on, the male gamers between ages 13 to 30, are actually the most volatile audience right now to design for. You know, we don't know why this is the case. It could just purely be a historical artifact, but right now, older gamers and female gamers are actually in a more homogenous design space. Let me touch on some findings related to specific game genres and, and game titles. Game genres are really messy things. They're constantly in flux and overlapping with each other. Genres are also misleading in other ways. They create the illusion that certain motivations go together when they might not. So let me walk you through a case study from an actual client project that we did. For the project, we were working with Eric Jordan. Eric is the CEO of Codename Entertainment. And among other games they make, they have an idle clicker game called Crusaders of the Lost Idols. And because the genre is so new, Eric was interested in understanding the motivation profile of the audience. And the reason why, one reason, why there was a lack of clarity in this genre's gamers is because the genre is historically rooted in two game parodies that were specifically made to not be fun. So one of these was Progress Quest. 
uh, a parody of MMOs. This is an actual screenshot of the game. It comes with that Windows background. Um, you, you start the game by selecting a character, race, and class, and you click sold, and then that's it. That's all the interaction that's needed from you. From that point on, the game plays itself automatically um, by going through dungeon crawls automatically. It, it wasn't meant to be fun, but a lot of people liked playing, having it running in the background, and watching their virtual progress accumulate. It was like having a pet that didn't just sit in the sun all day. You came home from work, and it had a story to tell you. Today, I made eight gold pieces. Um, the other parody was Cow Clicker. So Ian Bogos created the game to satirize social games on Facebook. You had a 2D sprite of a cow. Every six hours, you could click on the cow. It would moo, and you would get a point. And that was essentially the entire game. Ian believed, I think, that once you stripped down the social games to the core essence, people would see how stupid they really were. So he was horrified when <laughs> Lots of people started playing the game for fun without any sense of irony and sent him emails of how cool the game was compared to other social games on Facebook. So it became so bad that, and I think Ian started feeling guilty about this, that he created the Cowpocalypse where he took all the cow sprites away. He announced this ahead of time. He said, I'm going to take the cow sprites away. And all that was left was the empty space, which you could still click. And people kept clicking. So Cookie Clicker is the first iteration of a modern idle clicker. It combined the clicking with automation via purchased managers. It added exponential growth as you leveled up. So the game became how quickly you level up is dependent on how well you optimize all this automated machinery. And the, the game that we were working on, Crusaders of Lost Idols, falls into that mold, but it's skinned with an RPG dungeon crawler feel. In our data, when gamers come through and take the gamer motivation profile, alongside the motivation variables, we also ask them demographic questions. We also ask them to list specific game titles and franchises that they enjoy playing. So within the data, we're able to pivot between demographic variables, motivation variables, and specific game titles and franchises. We had the data for three idle clicker games that Eric was interested in. So Clicker Heroes, Adventure Capitalist, and their game, Crusaders of the Lost Idols. Nick Dushan and I, we went into this project thinking that we were looking at a casual gamer base for these games. But it turned out that the population, the profile for all three, was consistent. And it aligned with our full sample average. 70% identified as core, 20% as hardcore, and 10% as casual. So our first thought was, Maybe we're doing something wrong with the data. Maybe we missed the data somewhere. But we brought the data up to Eric, and Eric said, no, this actually aligns with another data point that I have that I've been puzzling over. On Steam, Clicker Heroes is ranked 19th by the number of current active players, not by the amount of time played, the current number of active players. It's, in fact, three ranks higher than Counter-Strike. And Steam is far from being a casual platform. We looked at the motivation profile for these gamers. The most important motivations for them were completion and power. Completion we've talked about. Power is how important is leveling up to you, getting a high level character, getting big stats, getting weapons uh, that are really powerful. The least important motivations were excitement, fantasy, and story. And the other games that were disproportionately popular among this audience were all mainstream RPG titles. So we were looking at a group of essentially core RPG gamers who were playing idle clickers. And then this light kind of stabbed in our heads. So in RPGs, there's always been this underlying group of players who never cared about the story or the world or the immersion. They were there for the persistent accumulation of power. They didn't care about the characters or the plot. They were playing RPGs because it was one of the few game genres around where persistent accumulation of quantifiable power was a primary game mechanic. In MMOs, these were the 
These were the min-maxers among you know, other types. You know, or put another way, imagine if, um, let's use Bartle's terminology for a second. Imagine if we went to the achievers in MMOs and we told them they could strip away everything they didn't care about in the game. And idle clicker is probably pretty close to what you would end up with. So this means that the, the typical bundle of things we call an RPG is somewhat of a historical accident. They seem like a coherent bundle of things only because we've been collectively staring at it for so long. But this bundling is actually a historical artifact. This means that genres are ripe for deconstruction if we can figure out where some of those potential fault lines are. And this fault line, this particular fault line, is actually hinted at, again, by the map. This is why the achievement branch is not in the same cluster as the immersion branch. They happen to make sense for a lot of players in the RPG bundle, but they're not fully on the same branch. Of course, this doesn't mean that player interest always falls cleanly along these boxes. Uh, unexpected segments occur. So when we work with clients, you know, they're typically interested in a specific genre space or specific demographic segment. And one thing we do is we use clustering algorithms to identify the player segments, the coherent player segments, in those specific audience spaces of interest. So these are clusters of demographic and motivation variables. So we were working with a client recently. Um, they were interested in a younger demographic audience. And we stumbled on a player segment that crossed the boxes, that crossed one of these fault lines. And it was a segment that scored high on strategy and story. Um, so we dug into this profile because we really wanted to understand what was going on. And it turned out that for uh, the gamers in the cluster, some game titles that they liked specifically, disproportionately, were Crusader Kings and the Fire Emblem series. And it was interesting because these are technically games in different genres on entirely different platforms. So Crusader Kings is a grand strategy game that's available on the PC. And Fire Emblem is a Japanese tactical strategy game that's primarily available on the Nintendo 3DS. But they're both games where you have a large cast of quirky characters where you spend most of your game planning who you're going to pair up in romantic relationships so that you can make the most interesting babies possible. Um, and suddenly we're like, oh, that's the underlying thread. Um, you know, that's the end of my talks. And in a nutshell, that's what we like to do with the data. We like to see where the data confirms the overall map, but we also like to see when we stumble into these places where the clean boxes break in these interesting ways. Um, that's my email, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Super interesting as always. Um, a question about volatility and within individual volatility. Because my understanding of how your data set is built is you're not multiple sampling the same people over time. You, these are, these, these are you know, between people comparisons in the population. Um, so do you have any inkling of um, whether an individual is gonna have high variability in these over time? Or um, like, 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 for example, the age stuff you highlight, could it be a generational thing versus an actually humans get older and this happens thing, yeah. for example? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. So currently our data is cross-sectional. So we don't have the data to, to prove or disprove this one way or the other. But I think what's interesting is in a lot of the charts, I think if we were looking at a pure generational issue, the curves would look a bit more chaotic because I don't think games have all been moving monotonically in the same direction. So I think for us what was interesting is most of the curves are actually linear, monotonic. Uh, only a few are quadratic and they're qu usually quadratic in the sense that they reach a plateau or a trough. But we don't, I think there's, there's one that is, that actually legitimately makes a cubic curve. Um, but you know, I think the, the linearity of the data suggests that we're looking 
at something that's more about an age difference rather than a generational difference because then we would see more chaotic patterns in the curve. That's our current intuition. Always amazing research. So what's next on your agenda of research plans? Where are you guys headed? Yeah, that's a good question. So we currently also have um, uh, a board game profile. So we have about 90,000 board gamers on um, a, a model that we did from the ground up, uh, you know, targeting board gamers. Um, you know, we were talking to some folks today that asked us, have you, ever, have you looked at regional differences in, in your data? So we have more data than we often know what to do with. So I think we're, we're moving in two directions. We're, we're, we're slowly moving through different slices in the data. So we, we will likely start looking at, you know, regional differences. Um, and then also kind of applying the same method and this method of collecting data in other entertainment spaces and collecting data from those as well. So those are two directions. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming to the talk. Yeah.